about R and some, some issues that are showing up. And I've intentionally put some, some topics in the data sets that make, make things more realistic for you. So there's missing data in some of the data sets. People have been asking, how do I superimpose the parts on top of each other? So let me just talk about some of those, um, and then we'll move on to uh, back to the topic where we were. So, Here's the data set that you're dealing with this week. Um, it's the, the summary of some raw material properties. So if we just uh, summary data over here, um, a little bit awkward with this, this is on, uh, on the small screen, but essentially we can see that what I want to emphasize here, uh, there's six variables in this data set. But what I want to point out is this NA. So we get the five number summary for each of the variables, but down here we see NA is 1, NA is 1, NA is 10, NA is 10. NA refers to numbers that are missing, if they're not available. In MATLAB you would have seen those as NADs, NA, NA, not a number. So in R we see the term, term NA. And it comes from the fact that if you look at the raw CSV file, there just isn't a value there. So when it is importing it into the data set, there's nothing there to import. Missing data are a reality. Um, you will, will definitely be there when you start to deal with the data sets from a database. The problem is in R that you start to find that you can't calculate certain things with these missing values. So, so standard deviations and means and so forth get to um, return NA to you as their answer because what does it do when there's a missing value? Right, it, it plugs it into the calculation, and then the answer is itself a missing value. So for example, um, if I load that data set, data density 1, let's just plug, uh, write it out there, there's the vector of numbers, and we can see that there's a few NA entries. If you type that SD of that, it goes and simply plugs that into the R, and your answer is NA. So that's not useful. You want, it's clear what you want. You want to calculate the standard deviation, ignoring the missing values. That's your best estimate of standard deviation that you can possibly calculate. So missing data are reality, how do we deal with them? We ignore them, we want to drop them out of calculation. Now short of you going to retake that vector and delete out the missing values and, and make the vector shorter, which is what students sometimes do. They take this data set, they get all frustrated, R is not giving me an answer, they go back to Excel, they delete the missing values, make a shorter vector, and then go and do their calculations. Well, no, you can get R to do it for you. Um, help SD. So let's take a look at the help function. Um, I've got it over here on the, let me just move this over. So this function computes the standard deviation of the values in X. If MA.RM is true, then missing values are removed before computation proceeds. So SD takes your vector X, but it also takes a second input, NA.RM. This usage is showing you the default call for SD. So by default, if I type SD and I give it a vector X, by default, NA.RM is set to false. False implies that if NA.RM is true, missing values are removed. If NA.RM is false, missing values are not removed. So in fact, SD cannot be calculated. My opinion, that's a stupid default. NA.RM should be true. However, I can also see why the default is NA.RM is false. Because it's so, it, it will force you to recognize the missing values. And deleting them automatically is maybe not what you want to have done by the software. So if you want to handle missing values, then go ahead and just read a jump the code up here. NA, uh, where was I? Okay, yeah, SD data density, put NA.RM equals true, and now when you call that, you get the useful standard deviation. So it, it will go and omit the, it's the, as it says here, it will omit the missing values if you the standard deviation value. That's true for many functions, like R, mean, median, MAD, any function where you're computing summaries of a data vector that usually will have an NA.RM option for you, and its default will be NA.RM is false. You need to go force that to NA.RM equals true when you have missing values present. Everyone clear on missing data and how to deal with it? Yes, actually. Um, I just have a question. If you, like, let's say you do that through your first set and then you're still working along later and you go and do some navigation again for like another data set, do you have to set it to true again or is it kind of hold up? It, it's only for that evaluation. It's only for oh. this 
instance where I call the standard deviation function. So it's not a permanent option that stays true afterwards. Okay. <coughs> so you'll find yourself filling your source code with a lot of NADR is equals true when you're dealing with a missing uh, data set with missing values. Another question that came up was on plotting and overlaying plots. Um, so let's take that same data set, let me plot the density um, column. So here it is. Um, now unfortunately, let me see. That helps, okay, that helps a bit. So there, there you go, there's the density values. Now there are missing values present, so let's emphasize that if I say plot and I say type B, that will connect the dots for me. And you see that R will not connect the points where there's missing values. So somewhere between here and here there was a missing value. Here's a missing value in between. So those points don't remain connected. Um, so that emphasizes that. Let's plot another variable. Uh, there's the color function. So in R you can create different color line plots and bar plots, etc. using the COL input. So let's create a red one here. So here's a different variable from the data set, density 2 this time, and it ranges between 11 and 17 on my y-axis. Now let's say I wanted to superimpose them. <coughs> here's what you have to recognize about R's plotting model. And this takes a while to get used to and understand, especially coming from something like Excel or something like MATLAB, which does a lot of automatic adjustment for you. R's plotting model is you are painting a canvas. So you've got your graph, which is an empty white space over here with nothing in it. Your first function will plot data, and it's literally like a painting canvas. You paint stuff on. Once you've painted it, you cannot remove it. Okay, so if I go and plot this original line in blue now, there's my density one variable, and it's got ranges between 34 and 42 on my y-axis. If I want to go superimpose that second variable, which ranged between 11 and 17, it's not going to show up, because 11 and 17 is somewhere down here. So I will not readjust that y-axis for you. That's the analogy. This is a painted canvas. You've already laid down the range for which you want to do it. So if I go and do the second line, or if I go run that second line, I won't actually see anything. So my plot doesn't change. It actually has gone and drawn it, but it's not visible to me. Now let me emphasize here, why am I using lines instead of plot? So the plot function is a function that will initiate a canvas and show you stuff. If you want to go superimpose on that canvas afterwards, I cannot go say plot something else. Because what that plot function will do is we'll go draw a second fresh canvas for me. It's not going to superimpose. So the lines function, However, it's different. The lines function does not initiate a new canvas. The lines function goes and plots on top of an existing canvas. An important point about that. If you don't have an existing canvas ready, the lines function is going to give you an error. It says that there's nothing to plot on because you don't have a plot already available. So the lines function will superimpose on the last available canvas, but it means you must have one already drawn in the previous instruction. So here when I execute the lines function, I don't see anything showing up because my canvas's range is not appropriate. How do I deal with that? Well, I have to go recognize that I must adjust my y limits. So if I now go and say plot the first variable, density one, and use the y limb input, y limb expects a vector. To create a vector, you use the C function, which stands for combine. So combine function will take any number of comma separated entries and create a vector. If I've got three or four or however many entries, in this case, YLIM expects a, a vector of two entries, lower bound and upper bound. So C, 10 and 45. This will create an awkward looking plot, at least initially, because it's now only showing my data, but it's done what I've asked it. I want Y bounds between 10 and 45. But then my second line here below it, now when I go and execute that, I get what I want. So I get my second variable showing up there in red. It's so not a terribly useful plot, it's just to demonstrate the point that you can overlay data over each other. Don't worry about copying this code down. Whenever I demonstrate code in class, I'll post it to the website right away. Okay? Everyone clear on that or any questions I should ask on, on plotting? 
it's when would it be beneficial to have a, a second axis on the right hand side? Um, well, there are many instances where, where the second axis on the right hand side is useful, uh, especially when you're plotting two, um, three or four variables, where say two of them logically belong on one <coughs> axis together and the other one or two belong on the other axis. So we see that from time to time that people want to emphasize a correlation between these variables. In fact, these two variables are very much correlated with each other. You can see that there's it's very hard to see because of the, this uh, scaling, but they do actually correlate together. The better way to, to show that is to show it in a, um, you can, in this instance, you can use a second y-axis for the red axis and, a, and, a, and your left-hand side axis for your blue. Off the top of my head, I don't in fact know the command required to, to do that, but I can use it one. Or to emphasize the, the correlation between these two variables, I would plug it on the sky. So that's a little bit about R. Let's go back to where we were last class then. So I will start here with this very theoretical messy slide where we were deriving the formula for a confidence interval for the difference between two variables. And the reason why I want to start is I want to emphasize some of the assumptions we have to make. The assumptions that we start off with is we follow our same limit theorem that our data in A and our data in B are normally, sorry, this is not the same limit theorem, this is to, to make a simplification later on. We assume our data from A and our data from B are normally distributed. We also assume that the variance between those two samples are equal. So the variance in group A equals the variance in group B. That allows us, therefore, the central limit theorem to write what the variance and of x a bar is the variance of x b bar. It's that variance of a divided by the number of samples taken and the same for b. Then a very basic rule from statistics says that the variance of a sum or a difference of two variables is equal to the variance of the independent sums, provided x a bar and x b bar are independent. So I'll talk a bit about that assumption in a minute. What does it mean for x a bar and x b bar? We create a z value then, and a bit of the discussion last class was how to interpret that z value as a risk. I'll show, we'll work through another example again now. And then finally, we can unpack that z value into a confidence interval, which has lower bounds and upper bounds. And I'm being very careful with my markers because last night in 3K, I used a permanent marker on this whiteboard. <laughs> had to come like an hour using alcohol to get it off. So uh, this is a whiteboard marker, and so I want to emphasize that my lower bound is from U B minus U A. So this is where we're going to is derive in that lower bound and upper bound, and we get those lower bounds and upper bounds by unpacking the Z value in the same way we did before. Okay, so this time, however, my lower bound is a slightly longer-looking function. It's X B bar minus X A bar. And here under the square root is my standard deviation. And Cn is the critical value from my normal distribution, depending on the level of confidence I've chosen. So my 95% <coughs> level, that would be a value of around about 2. And the reason why we're saying Z is normally distributed and not T distributed is because we're using a population variance down here. Okay, so this is assuming I know a population variance, which could well be true if I've got a lot of data to draw on. So in this example we looked at previously, we had 300 data points from many years of operation. The standard deviation of that, even though a true statistician wouldn't call that a population variance, for our purposes it absolutely is, because it covers a wide enough region of period of time. But if we don't have a long period of standard, uh, a long period of data to draw from, let's say we only had those 20 samples of A and the, sorry, the 10 samples of A and the 10 samples of B, I've got a very limited data set. I don't have a population standard deviation. Well, I can still calculate a standard deviation by pooling those two variances. So 6.81, the variance of the first example, and it's 6.70. When I pool those two values, it's clear that I should expect a variance that's somewhere around those two numbers. So somewhere between 6.8 and 6.7 should be my pool variance. And in fact, if you pull up, take the square root of this value over here, you will get the number that's around 6.8. 
So this is the standard formula for cooling variances which you come to with from your progressive of course. Now I'm using my estimate of my variance. I don't have my theoretical variance. So now sigma squared becomes sp squared. And that z is now t distributed and not normally distributed. So when I look up my critical values to create the confidence interval, and I haven't shown the formula yet to the confidence interval, but it's identical to the one before. Let's just go back to that slide here. The only thing that changes now is I replace cm with ct, and sigma squared gets replaced with sp squared. Okay? Because I've now gone and used an estimate of my variance, and I don't know the population. <coughs> That's all that changes. So to continue on that example of the comparison between the one control system A versus the second control system B, if I sub in the values that I know for, this, for the variances, calculate my Z value, I can see I get a value of one. I ask now, what's the probability of seeing a Z value smaller than one? It's the area from minus infinity up to one, which is about 83%. That's a 16% risk, 84%, 84% percent about 16% risk. So 100% minus the Z value I interpret as risk, is the risk that you're wrong. The risk that you're saying these two systems are the same when really they're not. So you've got a 16% chance that you're wrong. So let's, uh, let's summarize those three methods to look at so far. Right at the start of the previous class, we said we're only using our reference data. This is the preferable way to do a test, is draw on a large body of data because you make absolutely no assumptions <laughs> between dependence, normality, nothing, nothing. All you simply do is you build a dot plot and you get your risk. In that case, it was 11%. You had, or let's say, one in 10 chance of being wrong. Okay? So Jonathan had said in the class last time, I would go with those odds because one in 10 is pretty good. But if I only use my 20 experimental runs using this external estimate of sigma, in other words, a population sigma, I got a value of 15% risk. Now my odds of being wrong are up, are up. If I don't have an estimate of sigma, I have to use my internal data to generate the sigma. So in other words, this is that pool variance we calculated. Now my odds are a little bit higher still, 16. Okay, so each one of these are telling you what is the probability you could have had no, no difference between the two systems, purely by chance. Now, one thing that we, I want to emphasize is that method one should be your go-to method. If you've got a large data set, use it. Methods 2A and 2B, these are the two methods that only use the 20 data points. Both of these methods rely on this assumption of independence in the data. What does it mean for data to be independent? Let's talk a bit about that for a minute. So this was the side discussion that was in the slides um, and I skipped over the last class. We will violate the assumption of independence as engineers. Our data are never independent. Most data sets we deal with are not independent. You take data from the stock market, those data are not independent. The price of a stock today is very, very closely related to the price of the stock yesterday, which is related to the price of the day before and the day before. Okay. The, day, the price of the stock today and the price of the stock last month, less, what? less related, far, far less related. So those are far more independent. But consecutive days of stock prices, these are not independent values of model number. Let's take a look at this example. This is a common example that you often see in experimental situations. So for those of you working in labs, uh, let's pay attention here. The reason why I'm talking about these examples is we know we want independence. How can we get independence? How can we guarantee our data are independent? I've told you that as engineers, we're going to often get data that are not independent. Let's talk about a few of those situations and then let's see how we could have made those data independent. So here's an example where if you're taking a sheet of paper and you're applying a coating to it and you want that coating to repel moisture. So this is often used in plastics. These uh, turkeys that you buy in the grocery store, they're those multi-layered plastic films 
One of those layers in the multi-layer are there to repel moisture, to prevent bacteria from traveling through the, through the barrier. So you're applying a, a layer or a coating to a sheet to enhance this moisture barrier property. And you take the sheet and you divide it up into 16 blocks after applying coating A to the top part and coating B to the bottom part. So you take a brush or, or whatever way of applying this coating, apply it to the single sheet, and then cut it up into 16 squares. But your top half is 8 squares of A and 8 squares of B. You send those 16 squares to the lab, they measure the hydrophobicity. Are those 16 values independent? plastic that you apply the coating to? Any other thoughts of what, what might make the data independent or not independent? Single batch of coating. So, single batch of coating makes it not independent. So, there, all of these are good answers. Uh, let's, let's understand why. If I take the sheet the sheet is maybe a, some form of plastic or some whatever it was made from originally. And let's say that that sheet was extruded or created in some way that there's, there's not non-uniformity in it. And we know that everything that we make is not uniform. So it could have been that as we created that sheet, there's some gradient of another property in it that's changing the direction. And so if I go and cut that sheet in, in half, and this is the B half, and that's the A half. There's this gradient in this direction that's due to some other property, say the melting point, or some other variable. And these are low values of that variable, and these are high values of that variable. So there's this gradient in this, in this diagonal direction. These, there, these A samples up here are going to have higher values and these are lower values of this diagonal distributed variable. If that diagonal distributed variable also affects hydrophobicity, we're going to come to the conclusion that A is different to B. If this diagonal distributed variable affects hydrophobicity. Assume that A and B has no effect on hydrophobicity. Okay? We're going to come to the incorrect conclusion. This happens a lot in the farmers' fields and, and, and plant trials. So when you're actually doing, uh, you're sowing crops or you're trying different fertilizers. So let's take the fertilizer example. A company is testing fertilizer A versus fertilizer B. They take two pieces of land and they use fertilizer A on this piece of the land and fertilizer B on that piece of the land. Unbeknownst to the company doing the trial, land A has soil that's richer in nutrients already up here, and this region of the land down here is lower in nutrients, because that's this diagonal gradient. Just the base soil has this gradient in it. So let's assume that A and B fertilizers are no different to each other. The company doing the plant trial is going to find that A produce is a superior fertilizer than B, but they've come to the incorrect conclusion. How could they have reallocated those, those plots of land, those pieces of land, so they would not have come to that incorrect conclusion. Um, how about, instead of um, applying to one half and uh, A and one half B, you would apply it like randomly across the piece of land? Apply it randomly. So that's the key issue here, is you have to do it randomly. Now, doing it randomly is expensive. Think of it from, a, from, a, from that fertilizer example. It means the company has to go and randomly allocate A's and B's here, and they have to go plot with A here, B there, B, A, A, B, B, A. It's so hard to keep, to actually physically do that. They have to then geographically mark out the pieces of land and very carefully apply the fertilizer and make sure that there's no crossover from region A to B. It's far easier to simply tell the tractor driver here's A, here's B, and call it a day. They're over and done. It's very easy to do your trial in that format. When we're looking at those hydrophobic sheets, very easy to simply cut, pull the sheet in half, apply
multiply A here and B there, okay? So not randomizing is always the easier option. So everyone in the lab, not randomizing, you're going to always, always make this mistake because you're gonna think, okay, I'm gonna just mix up reagents A, I'm gonna mix up reagent B, do all my experiments with reagent A, and then do all my experiments with reagent B. You're not getting independent data there. It's far harder to go make A and then B and then B and then A and A and A and then B and A in a totally random order because you have to do far more work to get randomized data. So randomizing is difficult, it's expensive. <laughs> so one thing you could do, uh, one other, sorry, just one other issue on, uh, on a, this topic of the sheets example, just coming back to it, is if I take these, these sheets of paper, so I go and I, here's one batch of sheets, and I take it from my supplier, and I go and apply A and B on these pages. And I say, well, I remembered 4C lectures, I'm going to go do this randomly. So you go and do this randomly, and you send those 16 values to your lab. But one thing you have to recognize is that this is one batch of sheets from your supplier. Your supplier has variability as well. So it may be that all the sheets in this, in this uh, package have got a higher value of a certain other property that's going to affect the high cost. What you have to go do is not only request one package from your supplier, you have to go request multiple packages, and then within this package, you have to go select random. So very important when you're doing experiments in a company, randomize your trials. But make sure also that the raw materials you use in your trials come from different lots in your supplier. Okay, the pharmaceutical industry messes this up from time to time. Other companies mess this up from time to time. They say, okay, we're going to go do experiments. They just go to their store and fetch one batch of material. They do the experiments and they get great results. They go and implement it and then a few months later it doesn't work. Because that one batch of raw materials was actually special in some way or different in some way. You need to go request multiple batches of raw materials from the supplier and do experiments on different batches of material. Okay, so don't just don't just focus on one sheet like this. You have to go and do it on multiple different sheets as well. So then the topic comes up, well, you say, okay, let's recognize that this sheet may be special in some way for my supplier. Okay? But this whole sheet is going to have elevated values of say viscosity or or of melting point. And then the next sheet from another batch is going to have lower values of melting point. So if you're looking at this data, you can say, well, you know what? That, that elevated value is going to cancel out if I subtract the values of B from A. So since this whole sheet has high values of A, uh, sorry, of viscosity or melting point, or some other property that's going to affect the variable I'm measuring, <coughs> if I go and apply samples of B and samples of A to, that, to the sheet, and then I subtract the difference between them, that difference is going to cancel out. So if it does affect my variable that I'm measuring, I can get a cancellation. And that's what a paired experiment is about. So I'm going to talk about, about that in, in either the next class or near the end of today's class. So we'll, we'll get to that point. So recognize that you can't deal with that, that level of um, non Here's another example to emphasize the independence. And this is, this is very, uh, very real. This is act from an actual example that um, I've seen before. So your company is testing a raw material. So you're currently using material from BASF and DuPont approaches you and says, here's a polymer pellet that's going to get you the same results. It's, it's um, a few dollars per kilo cheaper than your current raw material. <coughs> Guarantee that you won't notice any difference if you use our raw material. Please switch to us. And you say, okay, fair enough. Let me run some experiments to check that your raw material is identical to my current raw material. So here, your statistical test is different. Here you want to do a statistical test that shows what should your confidence interval look like afterwards. You want to switch to a raw material without affecting your process. You're going to do tests from DuPont and you're going to do tests from BASF. So here's mu BASF minus mu DuPont 
You want them to be the same. So you want to switch to supplies. You want your lower bound and your upper bound. You want those bounds to span zero and roughly equally, so roughly symmetrically, to show that there really isn't any difference. Okay. But you don't have a lot of data from your new supplier or your potential new supplier. You've been using DuPont for years and years, but now you're switching to BASA. So your first response should be to go use that long period of data that you have available and build a dark plot. Let's say you don't have that data easily available. It's in a database that no one knows how to extract the data from, which sounds weird, but it's true in many companies. They store data but have no idea how to get it out. So your only, your only source of data is these recent runs. And you want to do a hypothesis test that will check those lower bounds and upper bounds. We know our hypothesis tests, or these confidence intervals, require the assumption of independence. How could independence be guaranteed, or how could we get lack of independence? Here's, here's an actual example that's happened before. So to use the new supplier's raw material, you have to go modify the dispensing system in your process. Their pellets are maybe in a slightly different shape, and the dispensing system needs to be changed. That changeover requires 15 hours of operator time. So you shut your line down, 15 hours you have to implement that physical device. And the supplier has given you enough material to run eight experiments. Each experiment, each batch takes three hours. Eight hours over the weekend, eight batches over the weekend, that's 24 hours. So you can run, run this over the weekend. You don't want to uh, do it during regular production time. So you set up to dispense on Friday night, that takes 15 hours. You run your test from Saturday noon to Sunday noon, that's 24 hours. Then you've got some time to get the line set back up for regular production for Monday morning again. So another 15 hours. So you can go do your, you've got your samples of A from the current process. Over the weekend, you're going to collect your samples of B from eight batches, and then go switch back to regular production after that. So you're going from A, like let's say Thursday and Friday, Saturday and Sunday, here's A samples, and then you're going to collect your B samples on Saturday and Sunday. How is independence being violated here? Well, what could lead to lack of independence between A and B? Probably different operators on Friday as opposed to Saturday and Sunday. Different operators? between the weekends and the weekdays. That's very common. Yeah. And you're probably going to have the same one or two operators running the same material. The same operators running the same material in days A and days B. So they're, they've got a, between the samples in A and the samples in B, you're going to have the same operators, so there's lack of independence there. Anything else that is going to change independence? Remember, we've got two, two requirements for independence. Independence within A, we need samples within A to be independent and samples within B to be independent. So what do I mean by that is... So my A samples, I've got XA1, XA2, up to XA. So these N samples need to be independent, and then my B samples need to be independent as well. And then also I have the requirement that XA bar must be independent from XB bar. Okay, so such a short time frame on Saturday and Sunday that you're not going to get independence within those samples from you. It's great, actually. <coughs> Similar to that comment, um, maybe if you're going, you might apply to doing one, one process, you could be either at the end of uh, productivity or efficiency on the processor or too high. Um, so just taking that sample of the weeds might be Okay, so if there's going to be changes in productivity, operators, their behavior, um, different factors that impact productivity throughout the weekday on Thursday and Friday versus Saturday and Sunday. And your material independent batches selected. Were independent batches selected? Probably not. Yeah, the supplier is only going to give us eight, eight batches. Unless you've requested eight separate batches. 
<coughs> Guaranteed goal that when you actually do that trial, your bosses and colleagues are going to force you to do this. Because what's the alternative if you want to randomize? A huge headache. 15 hours of changeover, backwards and forwards, randomly every time. And you have to do it, some tests on, on the weekday, sometimes on the weekends. Huge, huge nightmare. No one is going to want to do this. Okay, so here's randomization. You know we need to do it. It's going to cost us a lot of money. It's incredibly expensive to randomize. But what's the alternative if we don't randomize? We're going to get lack of independence and we're going to make a decision that could be wrong. Okay, so it's, it's incredibly tough to convince people to randomize. Other things that could go wrong, all those are good reasons, but some other things to think of is, for example, when you're doing these plant trials on Saturday and Sunday, you're going to take these samples of bee, and you're going to have to wait till Monday morning to send them to the lab, and there may be some deterioration over time there. Whereas the samples that you do on, on those weekdays, they get sent to the lab right away, and they get evaluated right away. The temperature on, the ambient temperature may affect the process, and that's going to change from Thursday, Friday, Saturday to Sunday. So the temperature may be getting gradually colder over those four days. So Thursday, Friday is warmer, Saturday, Sunday is colder. There's going to be an effect of temperature on your process that's going to show up. So really, the only way to counteract any of these problems is to randomize. So, so here's some of the things that could go wrong. It's expensive and impractical to randomize. That's the key point. So here's a suboptimal solution. One is that you can group them into groups of A's and B's. So 4 and 4 of A, 4 A, 4 B, 4 A, 4 B. So you could run, on one weekend, you could run A and then B, just four experiments. And then the next time, you could run 4 B of B, 4 of A. So you've kind of randomized, but you haven't completely randomized. So these start to move into a topic of called split plot experimental designs. So those are important experimental designs that allow you to make experiments that are more practical to implement that don't require as aggressive randomization. So a pure randomized experiment is extremely expensive. But the way I see it in, is the interpretation is that it's an insurance. So you pay this price to randomize, but it's an insurance that you're going to get data that you can then work with afterwards. Okay, it's going to, it's like a price you have to pay to avoid being misled. Yeah. What's the outcome of uh, pre-mixing um, the feedstock A and B. Then you don't know which, you're, you're trying to make a decision, is A, uh, is your new feedstock B, no difference to A. So if you blend them together, you, you, you're not able to tell that. Isn't running A, 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 B, B, B once, and then B, 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 A, A next, still running all the Bs sequentially? Yes, it is. Um, but you're then you're you're still going to get independence within those four A's. Oh, I meant on the next set, the one below. Yeah. So right. here you're yeah. going to get in lack of independence there, lack of independence there. But what you are going to get is you're going to get two groups of B that are not independent, two groups of A's. So there's there's less dependence than having A to A and A to B. That's why I call the suboptimal. It's 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 one step towards trying to randomize, but you're not quite there. Yeah. But it's a, it's a, yeah. Not quite, quite independent, but you're right. So what I want to just uh, talk about then, here's, here's a, a discussion on lack of independence, because we have to realize that our data are not independent in many cases. So this discussion is primarily for the 600 level students, but it's also a discussion for the rest of the class to understand how modern statistics work and what lack of independence effect is. So. Modern statistics, statistical research takes this approach in many instances. This, is, I, this may not be in your slides, so it's, it is posted on the website. Um, so many problems in statistics can't be solved theoretically. So we're asking here, what's, the, what's going to be the effect on my confidence interval if I have no independence? So what I mean by that is let's take a look back at my confidence interval. I'm going to calculate a lower bound, and I'm going to calculate an upper bound. And those upper and lower bounds will be correct, provided the assumptions of independence are met. What if independence is not met? Are these bounds going to get closer to each other, further apart, or have 
really is this assumption of independence just something that we need for the derivation, but ultimately has no significant impact in the world about it. So those are my three options. Either the bound is going to be wider than it, than it should be, the bound is going to be narrower than it should be, or really the bound is going to change by a little bit, but not, not by much. So statistical research, and this problem can actually be solved theoretically and analytically on paper. You can derive a proof for it, but it's extremely messy. And this is an easy statistical problem to solve, and it's messy. So what we tend to do these days is we just simulate. We throw all the data at the computer and the computer to tell us what's going to happen on multiple simulations. So here's something that you guys can do. So last year this actually was posed as a problem for the whole class, not just 600 level students. But um, you can easily do this in an assignment. Take data and simulate data that aren't correlated. So that are, in other words, that are not independent. And you can use this formula over here to generate data that are not independent. So this formula says take your current data point, so you start with a value, you multiply it by phi, which is a, a, a number that I'll talk about in a minute, add a random value to it, and that generates your next data point. That next data point becomes xk on your, on your second iteration, multiply by phi, add an ak to it, and then you get your third data point. So you create what are called autocorrelated or self-correlated data. And that's a, a lag one autocorrelated data because only the previous data point affects the next data point. <coughs> AK, these are random values that I take from the normal distribution with mean of zero and variance of 25. This is just an example. And I'm going to generate 100 values. So I'll create a vector of 100 entries that have that relationship between them. Now if phi is zero, those 100 data points are independent because there's no relationship between the previous data point and the next one. And that's exactly the definition of independence. That there's no possible relationship between subsequent points. And that is true when phi is zero because then xk plus one is only equal to ak, and ak is from, from the random number generator. So to generate ak in R, you would just use the R norm function, and you'd say, um, you give it the mean, and I think it takes a standard deviation. So R norm, mean of zero, standard deviation of five will generate you random numbers. And you can run that command over and over and over, and you'll get random numbers. If phi is not zero, I'm going to generate data which are not independent. In particular, if phi is, this should be equal. So if phi is equal to 0.7, I'm going to generate co positively correlated data and phi negative 0.6 and generate negative recovery. So what I did here is I generated these 100, 100 samples. And for each of those 100 data points, I can go calculate x bar. So I generate 100 data points, calculate x bar, and then, so I calculate an x bar value, and I'll call that x bar one. I generate another 100 data points, that's x bar 2. Another 100 data points, x bar 3. And I went and did this a thousand times. So many samples of piece of simulated data. If the data are not correlated, so these are purely independent data, let's assume phi is equal to 0. x bar 1 comes from the normal distribution with mean of, will be the mean of, X bar one. Taking 100 samples, they're purely independent. Really mean of zero, and what would be the standard deviation or variance? What would be the variance? One. What is the central limit here? Tell me. I'm taking. The average of 100 data points from the same limit here, that average should be sigma squared over n, which in this case is 25 over 100. So I'm generating data, xk plus 1, phi is 0, these data are independent. So my variance of A was 25 units 
I'm taking 100 samples of that from the central limit theorem, x bar 1 should have a mean of 0 and have a variance of 25 divided by 100. Or in other words, sigma is going to be equal to 25. So if I truly had independent data, that's what I would expect. x bar 1 will have a mean of 0 and a variance of 25 squared or a standard deviation of 25. That's got, to, that's got to be clear. That's a basic application of the central limit theorem. So I can go do this many, many times, and here I did it a thousand times. I can go calculate the average of the means, and I can go calculate the average standard deviation. And I can go see how that, that happens, what happens to that. So let's take case C where there is no correlation. The data truly are independent. If I go do that many times, I can go estimate that variance is on average 0.52. So that's very close to the theoretical variance that I expect. However, if my data are not independent, so if they're positively correlated, what ends up happening is that the variance of those data get inflated, 1.66. And if the data are negatively correlated, the variance decreases to 0.32. Okay, so this is this is now telling me what what I expect to happen to my confidence interval. Because the reason why I'm focusing on the variance is if I look back at, at my confidence interval equation, my confidence interval equation over here is x b bar minus x a bar multiplied by my critical value multiplied by my sigma or my variance that I estimate. If that variance has gotten bigger, my confidence interval bounds are going to get bigger. And then that's going to tell me how, how bad I'm going to be relative to the theoretical case of purely independent data. So for positively correlated data, my bounds are going to be larger. For negatively correlated data, my bounds are going to be narrower than normal. That's immediately giving me a guide on what I can then do to adjust my bounds or to recognize when I've got lack of independence, what's going to happen to my bounds. Okay, so I just wanted to do that, have that discussion here just to give you an idea of, of how statistical research goes these days, it's purely based on simulated data, but also to show you that even though we've assumed independence, we can deal with cases when there are lack of independence, we now know what's going to happen to our lives. Okay, so in terms of the next class, I will uh, go through this example over here. Please, you can try it ahead of time and, and, and see what your judgments are, and then we'll finish up this chapter and start the next chapter.